Okay. You've put a lot of thought in your governance and security model for the cloud. You've locked everything down. You've set up role-based access control. Developers can access production directly. So you're safe, right? All you're doing now is worrying about this person who you think is a hacker from the outside dressed in a hoodie. And I want to tell you, no. If you're using DevOps, your biggest concern should be you and your developers, because I'm going to hit you from the inside. And all I'm going to do is make a pull request and you won't even know I'm coming. So the reason why you'll be attacked from the inside via DevOps is because most people don't fully understand what's going on under the hood. Um, and if you don't do that, then you don't have end-to-end -end RBAC in place um, or end-to-end -end governance. And it's easy to just bypass this crazy complicated setup you devised. This is the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework Enterprise Scale. Um, so you've thought about everything around the cloud, right? But you kind of forgot about, okay, how do I as a developer get to the cloud? So um, I'm going to explain that to you today so that you understand conceptually what's going on. Um, and it's important to note as well, this is cloud agnostic. This is not Azure specific. Um, so you'll have these issues no matter which vendor you use. So Again, we're starting off with a cloud that you've sort of secured, right? So you've locked it down, you have a RBAC model, and the developer cannot directly deploy to the cloud. So instead, what you do is make them push to a Git repository, right? Their code changes go there. Um, the code changes are picked up by a CI CD build server, right? This could be Azure Pipelines, this could be Jenkins, this could be GitHub Actions. And actually this build server can deploy to your protected um, cloud resources. So you might be thinking, okay, I have only one like credential, right? And actually there'll be a service principle that I have to manage and that's in the build server and it can deploy. But if I have, you know, 10 developers or even hundred developers, I don't have to worry about managing those, you know, 10 people, they can't deploy to production. Um, what most organizations um, don't quite realize, right, is that Actually, they do, right, via the Git server. And so how do you control when the build server actually picks something up and makes a change to your cloud resources? So you do that by um, focusing on branches, right? Which branches trigger what? Um, and to make sure that not everybody can just trigger a production deployment like that, right? Um, because then that's the same as just letting the developer sort of um, directly deploy to the cloud. Um, the most common mechanism used is a pull request. Um, but what I want to explain to you further now is what is actually a pull request? What is going on under the hood? Because more often than, the, than not, they are misconfigured, right? And if you have somebody like me, right? And I don't wear a hoodie or sunglasses, I actually look like a very respectable person. Um, and in my previous role as an enterprise architect at an insurance company, I would go and poke holes and get repos, et cetera, just kind of for fun. Um, and uh, it just goes to show you that actually, if you really understand what's going on under the hood, it's really easy to hack in to um, your cloud resources. You have to really understand what a pull request is. Like, what is it under the hood when it comes to Git? Um, because a pull request is really a feature that's supplied by the Git server, right? So all the major uh, vendors do that. GitHub does it, Azure repos, GitLab, et cetera. Um, but under the hood, you still have Git, okay? So to understand it, let's start first with feature branches, right? Before we even talk about production. Um, how do those changes get merged into your main branch, right? Which might be your, let's say, branch... Uh, that corresponds to your staging environment. So how do these feature changes get into the main branch when the main branch is protected? So the answer is, right, via pull request. You already knew that. But what is actually happening, right? When if I make a pull request and a CI build is triggered, what is happening? Well, there's an event that fires off that CI build. And so generally that is the pull request open event, right? Um, most of the time, I think pretty much all the CI CD vendors will also uh, trigger this uh, pipeline if you update the pull request, right? Um, so you want to make sure that the changes that you want to push into the target branch 
um, they are up to date in terms of the tests run on that. So CI is normally for like code quality checks and like unit tests and things like that. But it's not actually, if you're doing it right, it's not actually touching your cloud resources yet. So I think one of the biggest misconceptions about pull requests and what happens is, okay, I'm merging it, right? That's a pull request event, right? No, it's actually a Git event. So when you say, I'm yes, I want to merge this, all those commits are going into a particular target branch, right? So right now we're talking about the main branch um, and it's not, there is no pull request close event. It's a, it's a Git push at the end of the day. So it doesn't matter if you're merging via squash or no fast forward, etc. It doesn't matter. What you have to understand is that a commit is made and that is a Git sort of push event. And so we only want to trigger deployments, right? We only want to touch our cloud resources when we have that push event. Um, and that is actually how I would hack you either from the outside, if you're running open source, right? I can just um, fork your repo, make a pull request. And if you don't set up your pipelines properly, then I can touch your cloud resources. Um, and if you think you're a large organization and uh, you know nothing's open to the public, I can still get you, right? So inner sourcing is when you, within your company, have repos that are publicly visible and developer teams can you know, learn from each other, but also create pull requests. Same thing, I will come get you this way. And so let's continue further. And like, what does this look like as you approach production and maybe what kind of things do you wanna check and do? Um, and I'm going to refer to my Devin's DevOps governance concept repository, uh, which you can refer to as well. Um, to explain how to properly set this up. Okay, so, so far we've talked about having a CI pipeline, right, which is triggered when you open a pull request and when you pull request and when you update it. So now we've said, okay, we want to take these changes. Um, we've merged them into the main branch. And then if we make a pull request to production, we maybe for infrastructure want to make additional uh, checks. And so in this pull request, what I'm going to do is actually um, do a configuration drift detection. So I wanna know what's gonna change, right? If I make these changes uh, to my production infrastructure, what options are gonna change? So in Terraform, you could use Terraform plan to do that. If you're using um, ARM, you could use the uh, what if command. And uh, when I open that pull request, I run this pipeline. It just does the uh, drift change. So that is information for me to decide whether or not I want to accept this sort of uh, pull request. So on the other side, it's only when I then merge this pull request into my production branch that it actually kicks off a deployment and changes my resources, okay? so. The biggest takeaway from this is that you should understand that a pull request, right, is a construct on the Git server. It's not necessarily a Git native concept. And that in terms of pipeline triggers, right, there's a big difference between a pull request open and update, right, and close. Close is not an event, okay? It cannot trigger a, um, a pipeline. What's actually happening is it's the Git push that's triggering the pipelines. So now that you've understood this, let's go look at some uh, YAML pipelines so that you can see um, how to set this up properly. I'm gonna use a real life example. Um, and if you know me, I hate hello world. So this is a project that I have public um, in the Azure organization. Um, and it's actually a concept as well as a demo for some of the stuff that uh, I'm talking about actually today. So. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about the demo itself. We're going to go immediately into the Azure Pipelines folder. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so that it's easier to read. Um, the important thing to understand is that um, you can always have multiple pipelines per repository, right? And when you're starting out, you might make one giant file because it's, you know, it's just easier to have one file that you have to think about. But as your workflows get sort of more complex or as you really try to lock things down, um, it might be easier actually just to split them up and you'll have some reuse, right? But a little bit of reuse is okay, right? When I can save myself minutes or hours over months of trying to figure out what was I going to do again? 
Um, I'm also super pedantic. Um, and as you can see, I've also documented exactly what each pipeline does by the file, the triggers, right? Um, and whether or not it actually deploys, so whether or not it actually touches sort of like the resources. And as you can see, only the CD pipeline does that. So you can take a look at this in your own time. Right now, what I want to do with you is go through the code. So if you remember from the diagram I drew earlier, right, the first pipeline that's kicked off when a pull request is made from a feature branch to a main branch is this one, ci.yaml. And uh, the point I want to show you is here for the PR on line 12, there's only uh, main. So it doesn't matter if it's somebody who has access to this repository and they're creating a pull request to the main branch. It also applies if somebody from the outside is creating a pull request to the main branch. Um, this pipeline will run, as you can see, in terms of Terraform, I don't initiate a backend, so it's not talking to anybody. It's just doing the most basic of Terraform checks against um, here, uh, yeah, the Terraform formatting um, spaces, tabs, etc. cetera. Um, you can see that there are also branch triggers, right? So these are pretty common. You've probably seen these before. If I make a push into any of those branches, this pipeline, very, very basic pipeline will run. So what's more interesting is this one, right? And if you remember, the detect drift pipeline is triggered when I make a pull request to the deploy branch, uh, which corresponds to like the equivalent of production in this project. Um, and that you will see that if I make a push to the main branch, this will always this will also run. So depending on what your pipeline is doing, right? Um, you can say, I know what code is going to actually enter the main branch and then it's okay. Like I will run this particular code. Um, for this particular pipeline, I've also said, if you make a pull request to the deploy branch, I also want you to run this. And it's important to understand that it actually is going to, uh, talk to the Azure, um, ARM API and pull in configuration. Um, so I kind of am slowing down a little bit here because I want to talk to you about the security implications of that. Okay. So before I do that, let's look at what this pipeline is actually doing. Um, and it is firing up the sort of, uh, remote, uh, backend state so that it can know like, okay, this is what I expect, what I have in state and what does Azure actually have in case, I don't know, Julie went into the portal and changed something and it's not what I expected. Um, there is no Terraform apply, right? It does some posting to the GitHub comments, et cetera, but there is sort of no, um, yeah, it won't actually deploy the infrastructure. Um, the reason why I want to mention this is theoretically, right, from the outside, I could also just make a pull request um, to this branch, to the uh, deploy branch. I don't necessarily have to make, a, make one to the main first. So then you're probably asking yourself, whoa, couldn't I just, you know, make a pull request and actually change this code and, you know, do a Terraform destroy. that would be awesome. Right? Um, no. So from the outside, you can't do that. And the reason being that when the CI CD, uh, server runs this, it will take the code that is already in the deploy branch. Okay. And that's why it's super, super important that when you do pull requests that you actually read what code is going on, right? So, uh, you know, let's just say we're, we're, we're going to ignore those people we think are in hoodies trying to attack us from the outside. Let's just focus on the inside. And what happens often is just a careless, um, mistake because you're under pressure. Um, as an administrator or as somebody who has responsibility over production, you really have to read what's going on in those pipelines because it's very easy for me to just sneak in like a, you know, Terraform destroy command and throw everything out. Or also in this one, um, if we look at the code, if I find it quickly, um, I purposely do not, uh, output any secrets. So if I, sorry, not pipelines, um, modules, let's go to Azure resources outputs. Um, and you'll see that when I create service principles, I explicitly say, go look at the key vault, right? Um, and I don't leave it out because for sanity check, right? Like it's just sort of, okay, I can see immediately in the text. I'm not outputting it. 
But if I were somebody who was careless or somebody who just wants to, you know, create trouble, um, I could create a pull request and just change this one line here somewhere. And when you're doing that code review, you really need to look at all those little lines of code because then this is how you accidentally output a secret, which might, you know, get into the logs, which are automatically saved in a million places, and then you have a big issue. Um, so keep that in mind that you really have to do like proper checking of the code when you do a, uh, a review, like really read every line. Um, and then for my example of, okay, this is open source. Can I, from the outside, just, you know, do a Terraform destroy, make a pull request and destroy everything? No, it's going to run what is right now, um, in the deploy branch when you make that pull request. So I'm super pedantic. I want to read everything. Um, if you can, like, if you want to try to hack this, um, this is not attached to my Microsoft subscriptions whatsoever. You would kill a Visual Studio Enterprise subscription that has nothing except this running in it. So go for it. Let me know. Um, okay. So that was detect drift. Um, just so you know what it looks like if we open a pull request, uh, that one was kind of broken. Ignore the fact that it's red. I'll explain somewhere else what it means. But, um, so these, this is what this detect drift pipeline does. Um, it actually runs the Terraform plan with detailed exit code. And if it finds something, it will, it will do this and say, oh, there's some change. Go look at it in the build server. Um, and there was no change, then it's just easier for me to theoretically say, yes, merge. Okay. So going back, the last pipeline is the CD YAML. And if we look at this one, really, really important PR none, none be super explicit and just say none. I don't care what the defaults are because I always forget. Right. Um, I forget because there's too many things going on in my head. So make sure that any pipeline you have, right. Especially if you're doing open source and especially if you have inner source within your organization, but just in general, best practice, just remember this PR none, no pull requests. Um, anything that actually, yeah, you know, deploy something, uh, take extra precaution that somebody from the outside can't trigger it. Okay. That's really, really important. Um, what else is in here? I think the only other thing to mention that for this particular pipeline is that you see it says Terraform um, auto approve. And that's because Terraform normally says, are you sure you really want to do this? And if this is running in a build server, a headless build server, you don't have that interaction, right? So we just say auto approve, which is why it's really, really scary what's going on in this uh, pipeline. So, um, yeah, you have the URL to this, check it out. I've documented what it does. Um, do this exercise like this, this pipeline overview table, do this exercise for your pipelines. Um, trust me, uh, if you're, if you have multiple repositories, which you probably do, um, wrapping your head around every project and what each pipeline does is yeah, really challenging. And if you get into a firefighting mode, you will be super, super thankful that you took on one day, you know, half an hour to sit down and just write this. Okay. So I hope that was helpful. Um, I hope you learn that securing your cloud resources directly, um, is not enough. Uh, that when you have uh, DevOps automation, that you really have to make sure that you've locked down those pipelines properly. Um, you've locked down the repositories and that you really look at that pipeline as code, what's going on, right? So examine your triggers, uh, make sure that you're only triggering pipelines that actually touch your Azure resources, regardless of whether or not it's just reading or writing, uh, when you expect it to. Um, and you don't want when somebody from the outside, be it outside your organization entirely, because you have an open source project or within your organization, if you're doing inner sourcing and it's still be an outside team, you want to make sure that when those actors create a pull request, they cannot do damage to your Azure resources. And, um, I'm saying Azure resources, but again, this is sort of a cloud agnostic, uh, concept and, um, I also talked about the importance of doing code reviews. So when you're doing that pull request, really look at each line because that's another way I would uh, try to get you is, you know, checking a lot of code and you're in a rush and you don't see that I changed something that will actually log a secret. 
out somewhere when it's run on a server. Um, so really, really make sure you pay attention to that. Um, if you find this useful, please give this video a thumbs up. Please subscribe for more tips. Um, I will also in a later video talk about how you can, on top of this, mitigate accidental changes to production by applying additional sort of like gatekeeping um, in front of the build server when it even wants to deploy. Um, but uh, yeah, so let me know, um, subscribe and um, see you soon. Oh my God, this is kind of fun to film like this, but I am sweating bullets wearing this sweatshirt on top of my normal clothes. And uh, yeah, it's a work hoodie, but um, it's nice, but it's warm. <laughs>